Hi all, I would like today for today's notable game to show you another of those amazing blitz encounters between Reuben Fine and Robert James Fisher in 1963. It so happened they played five times. The most famous one is known as Shock Treatment and it was the most famous because it was in Fisher's My 60 Memorable Games. He had beaten Reuben Fine in an Evans Gambit in 17 moves. But let's have a look at another one of the five games. And before doing so, actually, I, I picked up some Blitz-related notes from Ruben Fine's wiki page. Uh, Fine, apparently, as a teenager, was quite keen on Blitz chess. He apparently played a great deal of it and eventually became one of the best Blitz players in the world. Apparently, early in the 1930s, he could nearly hold his own in Blitz against the then world champion Alexander Anakine. And Fine admitted though that he had played uh, Blitz with Anakine's predecessor, predecessor Jose Raul Capablanca, who beat him mercilessly. <laughs> so apparently Capablanca was maybe stronger than Anakine. That's an interesting thing I found. And also Fine, apparently he won the US Speed Championships of both 1944 and 45. Ruben Fine in ordinary tournaments did fantastically well, especially before World War Two. In Nottingham, 1936, uh, he was high placed. But uh, even better in the Avro tournament of 1938, which was sponsored by the Dutch broadcasting uh, company Avro, uh, he actually won that tournament, and he came ahead of Mikhail Botvinnik. And that tournament was actually part of the, its design. Uh, was to find a challenger to Alexander Alkine. So World War II kind of messed, messed the plan up a bit uh, for the candidates. And in fact, 10 years later in 1948, he declined uh, the possibility of entering another tournament like that designed to find a challenger to Alexander Alkine. So in 1948, and he, he turned into a, a psychology as his main thing, you know, chess became a pastime. So the, the these these blitz tournaments in 1963 is you know when he's like uh, just just chess is a, a sideline now. But nevertheless, let's have a look at this game. So d4 from Ruben Fine, and Fisher played knight f6, and we saw c4 g6, and we go into a Grunfeld defense. Bishop f4, a solid move in live book. It's actually the third most popular move though. C takes is the top, knight f3. Bishop f4 is the third most popular. Bishop g7, e3, solid again. Queen b3, putting pressure on d5. And now Fisher played c6. The structure is quite rigid here. Rook c1. D takes c4. Fisher forces matters quite a lot here. A lot of forcing moves are played by black after bishop takes c4. b5. And now bishop e6. And these, these are perfectly reasonable from Fisher at, at the moment, it seems. But maybe this next one is a little bit questionable. b4 is played. Fisher leaves himself with a backward c pawn on the c file after knight a4. This is a very nice square for the knight. Uh, Fisher's idea was another forcing move, but it seems he's gone overboard in forcing moves. Maybe it was that brilliancy in 17 moves in, in, in an earlier blitz game is encouraging Fisher to play a bit forcefully. He's attacking a2, though. That's defended. He's not really attacking g2, because the queen would be trapped. Uh, so that's just parried. But, you know, Fisher can't take here on g2. He played knight h5. If he does, bishop f3 is the end of the queen here. No squares. So another forcing type move though, knight h5. But now it's white's turn to force things. Bishop f3, kicking the queen out of d5. And now we see just simply knight e2. White is not worried about losing that bishop here. And look at the formidable pressure on the c file, on c6, focal point, and on c5. So positionally, the forcing moves b5 and b4 together don't seem to do too much for black's pawn structure issues the longer term aspects of the position bishop d5 
from Fisher trying to parry this pressure. But now e4. And black tries to solve the position tactically a little bit with knight takes f4, another 4 c move. And the bishop can't obviously go back, it would be like wreckage if bishop e6, this wasn't played, then knight takes is very, very nice. And look at black's pawns now, they're just a wreck. So Fisher tries here, bishop h6, and things get really interesting. So Fisher maybe was relying on this, but um, you know, Ruben Fine shows he's not too averse to doing positional exchange sacrifices if needed. Uh, he's going to let black off the hook if he plays something like g3 here. Maybe just bishop e6 and then you know the knight's pin is he really going to take on e6. What he does do is an improvement on that. He actually, guess what white actually plays here if I give you five seconds starting from now. White play against Fisher. What would you play here? Okay, he's had enough at this time of Fisher's forcing moves. He plays e takes d5. Let the bishop take on f4. And here, attacking the rook, is black going to solve the problems if the rook moves? Black just take here and dissolve the backward pawn on the c file. What does white play in this position? Do you want to play rook d1 or something else? Okay, d takes c6, positional exchange sack. And it leaves two issues with black's forcing moves this time around. If we look at this position, we can dart squares around the king. How important are these? And the dangerous, potentially dangerous past pawn here. Added to that, the knight can swing in potentially to c5 usefully, or the c5 square still is in white's control. The bishop looks very nice on f3. Fisher tries to solve this problem on the queen side, blockading the pawn, essential. Castles, and he blockades the pawn. We see rook e1, though some pressure down the e file. e6, a tempo gaining rook e5 on the queen. And in fact, this is quite a nuisance. If the queen goes to a6, then maybe this tempo gain, and then knight d7, and then we're on to f6. So black has to tread carefully here. This, this looks unpleasant. These dark squares are linked in with the past pawn here as two major issues for black to tackle. So black plays knight d5. There's a small concession here though after bishop takes, e takes. White possesses that e file potentially. He can get a grip on the e file. But first he's looking at g7 with this next move it seems, h4 to try and get a pawn here to highlight g7. But now Fisher goes for that C pawn, rook a c8, and we have h5 going for the g7. Queen b5, is the pawn going to get swallowed up? c7, and Fisher logically goes for the pawn now with queen d7. Although apparently in this position, there's another issue to tackle this e file domination. Maybe Fisher would have done better, it seems, from an engine perspective to play this, to try and tackle the e-file first and take the pawn more at leisure. For example, this position where black has got e-file control now and swapped a pair of rooks off. Still faced with some dark square weaknesses, but this should be fine now after queen e7. Fine, pardon the fun, <laughs> pun. Uh, but Fisher's choice here lets white still dominate the e-file with queen d7. He tackles this problem, still got this problem, but a new problem has arisen, e-file domination. Queen e3 marks domination of the e-file with the entry point e7. If black doesn't take on c7 now, he does. So Fisher's resolved one issue, but he's still got two issues now, the e-file and his weakened dark squares. Not only that, this knight coming to c5 is a pain because the queen is nannying the d5 pawn as well. And perhaps here black should be content with draw, even though he's the exchange up. Black's position here is fairly miserable in terms of counterplay. It's difficult to see how black can generate sufficient counterplay if he just sticks around nannying 
uh, d5. White can just maybe improve the position uh, or just do nothing here. It seems a very difficult Vulcan like grip on the position here. Believe it or not, if Fisher just played queen d6. It's, it's the combination of the weakened dark squares and this e-file, these two issues together. Uh, if you want some proof of that, I'll just run through with you. I think the evaluation is fairly stable. If we look at this position here, it should be fairly stable by my uh, reckoning. If white just does nothing, black is also apparently, the engine is not able to do anything for black. This, this possession of the e-file is very good. If, if the rooks ever kicked out, then, then it's, it's going to be a disaster. You know the dark squares and the knight coming in for the kill. This this could be a disaster. Yeah. So this is a very good grip on the position at this point. So credit in a way. I'm I'm emphasising this because credit in a way because he's kept some issues going against black basically against the legends of Fisher. He's kept some issues going, and Fisher goes for queen g4 now, which is slightly risky. H6 installing that dangerous pawn now, marking out g7, still possessing the e file. We have rook c6, and yeah, the, what what was to be done at this point about this d pawn? It's getting dangerous. So the d pawn drops here. Rook f6, and it's starting to be losing now. Absolutely losing for black after knight d7. Uh, this 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 is this is getting exceptionally dangerous. This position, forking the rooks. Fisher tries rook e6, but now rook e5, very powerful move, rook e5. And it's very difficult to see what black is doing here. What does black actually do here? If rook e8, then it would seem knight f6 check is a killer uh, tactic. You know, if takes, then rook takes e8, mating because of that pawn. So it's difficult to see what, what black is doing. Uh, th this looks terrible as well. Queen takes looking at both taking on f8 and mating here. Uh, this this position is could, could lead to something similar to the game. You see this queen h5 potential resource. Uh, but we'll see the game continuation. Here, queen d1 check. In this position here, after King H2, we see Rook takes E5, Queen takes E5, and Black resigns here. Fisher resigned here. It's it's pretty hopeless actually. Let's let's check out this final position just, just to show the different things. If a Queen exchange occurs, then this is a winning King and Pawn ending for White. White doesn't have to go for the H5 uh, Pawn. He, he can uh, just go f for the center or he can actually just do that as well it's it's pretty pretty easy to win this this position because as soon as king d5 we just go king f6 there are various ways of winning that king and pawn ending um, now also if f6 this is strong check and then taking here just taking an entire rook and if black refuses, then there's queen a8 check. And you see the coordination on f8 here leading to mate. So yeah, Fisher was already in grave difficulties. When he lost his d pawn here with queen g4, white is at least uh, equal. In this position, white is at least equal. And after knight d7, yeah, it's, it's getting really hard. So as, as mentioned, this one, there's knight f6 check. What does black actually do here? Black's actually in an impossible position uh, after this scenario, rook f6. The, the moment here to try and keep equality, apparently, rook c7 might be still a bit tricky. It, it's actually a very tricky position here. White well, still controls that e-file. So an improvement move like this to give the king potentially uh, g2 to avoid these checks improves the position what is black actually doing let's improve the position for white and let black, the black rooks be passive 
now you might think is this enough the exchange down well it's this pawn now is another issue it's not just the dark squares this pawn and um, this this should be very interesting uh, prospects for white here even if the Queens come off there's very interesting prospects here like d7 for example here looking at f6 and you see it's it's very difficult for, for black to actually play this position this this is given as better for white and white can actually in some variations take the exchange so basically um, let's go back to the final position and talk about the game a bit uh, it is an interesting game one of the five that actually the only one of the five that Ruben Fine actually won but I feel he's such a great player this this was a world title contender player who who didn't really want to play in the 1948 tournament 10 years after his amazing Avro tournament because he felt the Soviets were just they, they were going to win it you know, with, with with some maybe uh, some, some some teamwork potentially let's, let's put it like that so he felt he was he was going to be wasting his time by playing in the 1948 world championship title because Alexander Alekhine had died uh, just after World War Two so they wanted to find uh, the new world champion basically and he could have competed for that uh, you know a brilliant player brilliant achievements and very very keen by all accounts at, and very very strong at blitz chess so even in 1963 he played this game and you might condemn this game oh didn't didn't white play a bit shabbily but actually if you look at it carefully white kept at least two major issues going at Fisher at the same time first it was the pawn and the dark squares and then okay although he lost the pawn he had then the e file and then the dark squares and then when he won that d pawn he had the pass pawn and the dark squares and the e file and it's all just leading to a winning position in the end with some inaccuracies from black so actually if the more you look at this game it was actually quite a good game from white's uh, perspective it was it was quite good quality I thought for blitz chess and I hope you do as well okay comments or questions on YouTube thanks very much